Automatic continuous monitoring of air quality is expensive. Therefore, plants have been used as bioindicators of air quality. In other words, dispersal of air pollutants and occurrence of harmful concentrations for ecosystems for decades. What is a bioindicator? Bioindicator is a living organism, usually species, that responds in a especially clear way to a change in the environment. And there are specific uh, characteristics for a good bioindicator, such as species basic biology and ecology is known well enough. The more sessile the species is, the better. Species should have wide geographic distribution and a clear tolerance area in terms of the studied environmental factor. Sessile plants are good bioindicators for monitoring air quality as they take up gases, pollutants such as sulfur dioxide, nitrogen dioxide, ammonia, and ozone directly from the air via stomata and or through their surfaces as water dissolved ions such as ammonium and nitrate. And especially evergreen conifers are good bioindicators because they have a large leaf mass per area and thus their canopies absorb and retain dry deposited pollutants effectively. The canopies also modify the amount and composition of wet deposition in other words, true fall reaching the forest floor. Uh, in contrast to, for example, sulfur and nitrogen, ozone does not accumulate in plants, but it induces an oxidative stress, which may result in visible injuries and or growth reductions. However, the sensitivity of genotypes, species and ecosystems to specific air pollutants varies and is also modified by other biotic and abiotic factors. For example, a seven-year Swiss study showed that species composition of a subalpine grassland is sensitive to nitrogen deposition, but not to ozone. Long-term monitoring of air pollution, and actually nowadays climate change impacts, is carried out in both Europe and North America at field sites in background areas, and these background areas are areas which are not close to any big emission sources. And this slide shows what variables are studied at the European ICPM sites. So those are sites for international cooperative program on integrated monitoring of air pollution effects on ecosystems. And you can see that there are variables related to air, to biosphere and to soil and even water ecosystems. Air pollution affects directly the structure and function of both terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. What happens in terrestrial ecosystems also often affects indirectly the water ecosystems in the drainage basin. The slide shows you examples of ecosystem changes under elevated nitrogen deposition in the North American mountainous ecosystem and you can see what changes happen when the nitrogen deposition increases from the natural background concentration to current concentration. Air quality in terms of protection of vegetation and ecosystem is regulated by, for example, the so-called air quality directive. Researchers contribute to the revisions or directives by providing new data from field and experimental studies to the working groups of UNECE, meaning United Nations Economic Commission for Europe. In this scope of the Convention on Long Range Transboundary Air Pollution, signed in 1979. So that means that in 1979, 32 states signed the convention, including many European countries, USA and Canada, and so on. And in this last light of mine, you can see examples of Finnish experimental and field studies. So in addition to long-term monitoring in the field, we need experimental studies and studies close to pollution sources to show and convince the politicians what effects the pollutants may have in the ecosystems and understand the mechanism by which air pollution affects ecosystems in long term. Thank you.